Hello, and welcome to this episode of Criminal Mischief, the Art and Science of Crime Fiction. I'm your host, D.P. Lyle. Today I want to talk about familial and genealogical DNA, mainly because it's becoming an increasingly useful tool to law enforcement, particularly in tracking unknown killers. If you look at DNA and how we use it, obviously if you have a DNA sample from a crime scene and you want to know whose it is, then there's CODIS and, and the databases you can load it up to, and if that person is in there, then a match can be made, the person can be identified, and then the police will go uh, obtain a DNA sample from that person for further testing and to confirm that that is indeed a match. Now, they may do this by a warrant. They may do this by simply requesting it. They may do this by following him around and finding some discarded object and then using that DNA to test. Okay, that's fine. You can also have DNA at a crime scene, and you can do uh, what's called uh, mitochondrial DNA. And what this will show is that what the maternal line is. And if you have a suspect and you have a female relative of that suspect up the genetic line, you can use that to confirm, hey, yeah, this is probably the guy. And then, again, you, you do the testing, either ask, warrant, or uh, uh, surreptitiously obtain it. But what if you have none of that? Sometimes uh, you have DNA samples that are obtained at crime scenes, particularly from many, many, many years ago and decades ago, that aren't useful. What if the individual is not in the database? What are you going to do with that? Well, recently we've come up with familial and genealogical DNA. They're really basically the same thing. Uh, familial means you, you test it and determine if someone is in the database that is related, closely related. In other words, their DNA has a lot of markers, 10 or 20 markers that they look at. They analyze segments of the DNA, and from those segments, they determine if there are matches, and if so, how many how strong those matches are, etc. And if you get a bunch of those, but they're not exact, but they're just close, then you know that the person who left the DNA at the crime scene is at least related or in some capacity to this other person. Now, is it a sibling? Is it a offspring? Is it a parent? Is it a grandparent? Is it a great-grandparent? What if it's a distant cousin? Well... At least you have a ballpark to play in now. It's not the whole world. You've narrowed it down. And that's basically what evidence does is it narrows down the field. It gets rid of all the people who can't possibly be that person and hones in on the other. As Sherlock Holmes says, once you get to the answer, regardless of how improbable it is, if everything else has been excluded, that's the answer. Well, that's pretty much how evidence works, and fingerprints and DNA are very, very good at that. So, um, genealogical DNA is pretty much the same thing, except they obtain, they compare the crime scene DNA with DNA in these genealogical databases. You know, GED Match and 23andMe and all those things that people load up there. And so, they, and it's obviously controversial, but, you know, any port in a the storm, they, they, they connect it to a person. And then they say, okay. The individual that left this sample at the crime scene is related in some fashion to this person. So look how that narrows down the world. Now you're looking at a family. Sometimes it's a large search you have to make. Sometimes it's smaller. So as an example, let's look at probably the most famous case that, uh, that familial and genealogical DNA was used in, and that's the Golden State Killer. In 1976 to 1986, uh, this person was responsible for over 50 rapes and 12 murders. It started in 1976 in the Sacramento area, Contra Costa County, various places around the Sacramento Delta up there, that a series of uh, rapes occurred. They had a similar M.O. The individual would break in at night. They would tie up the individual. They would commit their crime, and then they would disappear. 
they did leave behind often semen evidence. They would whisper in a very raspy voice, you know, that I'll be, uh, I'm going to do this, never, they're never going to find me, and I'll be gone in the night, which becomes important later. Uh, and then he became known as the East Area Rapist, this unknown perpetrator. And our EAR, they called him. Uh, then he kind of stopped for a while after doing many, 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 many breaking and enterings and rapes. And then in between 1979 and 1986, 10 murders occurred in Southern California, uh, everywhere from Santa Barbara to Ventura County and down to Orange County. Uh, this individual they had no idea was the same person with all the Sacramento rapes at first. And he was dubbed the original Night Stalker. And the way that came about is that in 1996, so 10 years after the, the last murder, the DNA was in the case of, in 1986, of Janelle Cruz's murder. And five years earlier, about 1981, the murder of Emanuela Withune. It, they found that those two matched. So what it meant is you had one person responsible for those two, and pretty soon they started connecting the others, and he became known as the original Night Stalker. And that's simply because he predated the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, who uh, roamed everywhere from L.A. to down here in Orange County. And uh, But that was later than, than this time period. So he was known as the original knife, knife, uh, Night Stalker. Well, it turns out that around that time, or, or, or later than that, that uh, a private investigator named Paul Holes and Michelle McNamara, who is the wife of a uh, very known, well-known writer and the wife of, uh, of Patton Oswalt, uh, started getting interested in this case and became really obsessed with it. And they worked years on it. They worked together and separately and did all their research. And and finally a connection was made that EAR, uh, the, the East Area Rapist, and ONS, the original Night Stalker, were the same person. Now, Michelle McNamara became totally obsessed with this. Uh, the story goes that she wouldn't sleep at night. She was up all night working on this thing. It, it literally drove her crazy. She uh, would take uppers during the day and downers at night to try to to keep going. And, and ultimately, she died unexpectedly in her sleep before this case was solved, which was really sad. Uh, and it was probably the mental abuse she put on herself as well as the drugs and whatnot, who knows? The point is that she was a very bright, very intelligent, a very good writer, became obsessed with this case, and in the end, at least it played a role in killing her. But she wrote a great book called I'll Be Gone in the Dark, and that title came from what the, uh, the uh, perpetrator had whispered to one of his victims, you know, they're never going to catch me, I'll be gone in the dark. And so she used that title, and the the book is great. There was a, a, a documentary series on it, which was fantastic. So if you get a chance, read it. And it's really the definitive story of this case up until the end. The book was published before he was caught, and so or was finished before he was caught. So it's kind of sad in that respect that she never saw the end game. All right, in. 2018, um, an officer realized that, that, that oh, uh, McNamara, Michelle McNamara was the one that coined the phrase the Golden State Killer. When she realized that the East Area Rapist and the original Night Stalker were the same person, she said, well, this guy's all over the state of California, and she started calling him the Golden State Killer, and that's the name that stuck. So a detective in about 2018, thereabouts, decided to uh, upload uh, the profiles they had from the cases to GED Match, one of the uh, um, genealogical databases. He had learned about this, and he wasn't sure it would work. He didn't know a whole lot about it, but he said, you know, let's give this a shot. And lo and behold, it found a match, um, or at least something close. 
but not real, real, real close. So to make a long story short, they spent a whole lot of time and built over two dozen family trees out of some of these connections to try to figure out who this person was. How does this really work? So in people who do genealogical research and want to know who their family is, where their roots were from, and all of that, they upload this data. And what happens? They start making connections. And they make connections up the chain, of course. You know, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. But the chain broadens with each generation because you've got aunts and uncles, you've got great-aunts and uncles, and great-great-aunts and uncles. You've got, great, you've got cousins, you've got great cousins, you've got great, great cousins. So the tree expands like a giant V. And so more and more people are involved in your genealogical tree. And so you have a much bigger family than you think. So you can find out, well, I was related to this historical figure uh, through my maternal grandmother's cousins, you know, twice removed, that kind of thing. So you find these connections. This uses the same information. Genealogical DNA in the criminal world starts building these trees to see who all is this person related to. And they whittle it down and whittle it down, and then they start looking at, okay, who's of the right age, who's of the right sex, who is in the right location. And you can see how that will start narrowing the field more and more and more. So they found out this individual was a male who who was of the right age and lived in the right areas at the right time. And again, to make a long story and convoluted story short, they came down because someone had had a, a family member had uploaded their genetic profile of the GED, GED match site, and the police had accessed that, and they had done all this genealogical tree building, and they took the DNAs from the 1970s and 1980s cases and started comparing it through all these different trees. And lo and behold, it ultimately led them to Joseph D'Angelo. D'Angelo was an old man by this time because his murders were uh, many, many, many years ago. I mean, he started in 1976 and we flash forward now to 2018. So many decades earlier. Um, then DNA was obtained from him surreptitiously, and he was matched, and sure enough, they found that he matched the DNA from the East Area Rapist, the original Night Stalker, ergo the Golden State Killer. And he was arrested, tried, and convicted. But it was genealogical DNA that led the investigators there. And I'm going to tell you, the the strong work of Paul Holes and Michelle McNamara played a huge role in this. And also some very clever detectives who decided to use this, quote, new tool of genealogical and familial DNA. Let's look at another example, the Grim Sleeper. Now, this was a case in California that... um, Between 1984 and 2007, over 10 murders were attributed to an unknown killer. Uh, At times he was called the Southside Slayer. He had uh, different names, and some some of the cases turned out not to be related to him. But at the end of the day, he he was tried. This individual was tried for 10 murders, even though he's suspected in many more. He got the name because... From 1984 to 2007, in the middle of that, he just um, stopped for 14 years as if he went to sleep. And then he reappeared. But he would break in, he would rape, he would murder. And the DNA was matching and, and that they knew it was the same person. Uh, it turned out and he was arrested in 2010, it turns out it was Lonnie Franklin that was the guy that did this. Okay. Lonnie had actually been arrested in 2003, but no DNA was taken because it wasn't required at that time in California. The law that required DNA samples to be taken 
from felons, people who were arrested and charged and, and convicted, of course, of felonies, DNA samples were taken and loaded into the database. So he got away because he was a year early. But then they decided, let's do some familial DNA testing and let's see what we can find. And lo and behold, they did find a close match. They started looking around, and it turned out to be Lonnie's son, Christopher. And it was a fairly close match. So now they knew that he was the right age, he was in the right location, uh, his profile suggested he could be the guy, and they had DNA that was similar to his son's DNA, so obviously Lonnie became the primary suspect. So they followed him around, and they found out there was a restaurant that he liked to eat at, and so they created a fake waiter who was actually an undercover officer, and he went in there and was waiting around, and when Lonnie finished his lunch and he left, he collected the utensils and the cup and the pizza crust. That was then taken and analyzed, and bang, it matched the DNA obtained from these murders. And so subsequent to that, uh, Lonnie was uh, arrested, and uh, he was uh, tried and convicted of these murders. So this is how familial DNA works. You get something close. You analyze the people close to this close match. Who could it be? Well, it's not going to be his sister. It's not going to be his cousin twice removed who's female. It's not going to be his mother, but it could be his father. And indeed, that's how it worked in the Lonnie Franklin or the Grim Sleeper case. Another example is a, a case of the murder of Jody Loomis. Jody Loomis was 20 years old, and she was murdered in 1972. And in 2008, when they reevaluated the case as part of a cold case thing, they found a semen stain <coughs> on Loomis's boot. Okay didn't really match, didn't really do anything. They weren't really sure what to do, do with it because, again, if it's not, the person's not in the database, you have nothing to, uh, to compare it to. So they did a familial DNA, and, again, it, be, it came back to a, a mat, close match to an individual called, uh, named Terrence Miller, and Terrence Miller became the primary suspect. So... This was in 2018, so we're talking, what, 45 years or so after the murder. And um, in 2019, he, dis he was being followed around to capture his DNA. He discarded a coffee cup. They picked it up. They tested it. They found that the DNA matched, and uh, he was arrested. Terrence Miller was arrested in 2019 for the 1972 murder of Jody Loomis. So you can see that familial DNA and genealogical DNA are powerful tools. They're not going to give you the answer, but what they're going to do is get you in the ballpark that you're supposed to be looking in. They get you in the neighborhood. And uh, sometimes that's all you can ask for. You get close, and then good police work takes over from that. So you can obviously see how you can use this in storytelling. You can easily have your investigator, whether if it's a police officer or a private eye or, you know, whoever that is doing this stuff, if, if you can then convince someone, and this happens a lot, where they will go to one of these genealogical things and say, you know, can you compare this to that? And uh, if you do familial and genealogical DNA, then you start narrowing it down. But let's say, and the cases like this have occurred, it comes down to it's like one of three or four brothers. You know, let's say the DNA matched a cousin or or a grandfather or a father, but there's four siblings involved. Well, you can just go follow them all around and collect DNA from all of them. You could just go ask them, though pretty sure the guilty party is going to say no, which in and of itself is evidence. You could get a warrant, though you probably don't have enough to get a warrant. Uh, you could, but maybe not. So you look at each of these individuals, and you can probably rule out a couple of them by age or geography or, or uh, circumstance or by their profile, 
And say you narrow the four brothers down to two that were in the area at the time who would have had the motive, the means, and the opportunity. And so now you go collect DNA from both of them surreptitiously. Again, discarded items. You can go through their trash. You know, they throw away a toothbrush or they, they throw away a, a, a cup of coffee, a, a paper cup. They eat in a restaurant and walk away and you pick up the utensils and uh, like has happened in the cases that I discussed here. And so you can see how you can use this in storytelling and create a very convoluted story with a lot of suspects and it requires your protagonist, your investigator, to do a lot of work. I mean, this is not easy. And he has to connect a lot of dots and then grab a lot of evidence. And sometimes it's not so easy. This is particularly true if the suspect knows he's a suspect. I mean, there have been cases where they're following uh, the, the suspect around and the suspect knows he's being followed. So what does he do? He goes to a restaurant. He uh, drinks through a straw. He uh, handles the cup with a... With a, with a napkin, uh, he wipes off his utensils, or he eats only places that have plastic utensils, and he takes them with him. Um, he takes the straw with him, and he doesn't discard stuff, and he's very, very careful. This cat and mouse game is pretty good storytelling. So at the end of the day, if you can use genealogical or familial DNA to get into the ballpark where your your perpetrator lives then there, you can use more standard police work and then ultimately standard DNA to prove yay or nay that this is the person. And I think the Golden State Killer and the Grim Sleeper and Jody Loomis's case, and there's many more like that out there, underline this. As always, uh, on my website and the blog and, and also on, on this post, there will be uh, links to these cases so you can read about them and study them. And I really do recommend that you read I'll Be Gone in the Dark. It's a wonderful book. And if you want to see how dedicated a uh, non-professional. Now, Paul Holes was a, was a retired investigator, but Michelle McNamara was a, was, a, was a true rookie in all this. How a dedicated individual can really help solve a case. And, uh, again, she gave it the name the Golden State Killer, so she will be known for that forever. So all these links will be there. Go read them, study up on them, and, and hopefully some of this stuff will help you write a better story. So until next time, uh, this has been D.P. Lyle, and this is a, another episode from Criminal Mischief, the Art and Science of Crime Fiction. Until next time, take care.